Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back into our Father's Word in the book of Leviticus, the law, the schoolmaster that would bring us unto Jesus Christ, as Paul would so aptly say in the New Testament. On the chapter 1 through 7 of Leviticus, we've had the sacrificial laws uh, established and stated for the people and the priests. And now in chapter 8, 9, and 10, 10 deal specifically with the priesthood, and we're going to be talking in this lecture a great deal about the consecration of the priest, or you could think of it as a, a dedication or even an ordination into office. And God had communicated uh, these instructions as far as what the priest were to wear, the head priest, the high priest in particular, uh, how they were to be consecrated, and all these back in the book of Exodus. But but not until after the sacrificial laws had been laid down, which we just did in the first several chapters of Leviticus, uh, now it's time to consecrate the priest. And Moses, uh, true to form, following instructions, uh, has gathered Aaron and the people, meaning the elders of the people, uh, the garments that God instructed to be made for the high priest and the other priest as well, uh, the anointing oil, the bullock, for the sin offering and the two rams and they're getting ready to sanctify if you will the priest and I want you to pay particular attention because we're going to see that uh, it's going to affect not only their flesh body what happens to them but we're going to see symbolically uh, their soul as well as their spirit uh, endowed with the Holy Spirit if you will through the anointing oil uh, will be dedicated to the Lord. In other words, flesh, soul, and body. So I should say flesh, soul, and spirit dedicated to the service of the Lord and the service of the congregation as well as also you could think of this. So we're going to ask that word of wisdom as usual in the name of Yeshua, Jesus' name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Leviticus chapter 8, we're going to pick it up with verse 6, and it reads, And most Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them, washed them with water and symbolically washing away the filth of the sin that was on even the priests. And uh, some would probably tell you in this time and day, well, uh, preachers don't sin. Well, let me tell you, anyone that says they don't sin and is, is a liar and he's deceiving himself. We all have sin. We all fall short in one respect, including the priests. And we're going to see uh, an atonement for those sins of the high priest before he enters office so that he enters office correctly. Uh, some think that this washing uh, is the same as Hebrews chapter 6 verse 2 where it talks about the baptism and that also of course being uh, symbolic of a spiritual cleansing. Uh, does that mean that they would never sin again? Absolutely not. Uh, as we'll see in chapter 16 uh, it was necessary for Israel on uh, and each year at the Day of Atonement uh, to atone for the sins that have been forgotten through the year. And uh, this states that uh, Moses washed them with water. That's possible, but all the uh, ceremonial washings after this, uh, the person washes themselves rather than being washed. This could mean that, that Moses caused them to wash or caused them to wash themselves. Verse 7. And he put upon him the coat, this is on Aaron, the high priest, and this coat, a very good description of it in Exodus chapter 28, and verse 4, and the following verses, and this is a, an embroidered coat, and girded him with the girdle, uh, better probably thought of today or understood today as a sash or a belt, and clothed him with the robe. 
and put the ephod, an ephod being a vestment or a ceremonial robe, upon him, and he girded him with the curious girdle, and this is the, the actually the band of the ephod, of the ephod, and bound it unto him therewith. Now this robe uh, uh, was interesting too. We don't have a great deal about it. Uh, it, it along with the breastplate that we'll cover in the next verse, uh, were quite uh, eloquent in, in design in the way they looked. They were made of gold, blue, scarlet, and purple. Uh, the colors uh, signifying with uh, deity, if you will, or leadership, royalty, probably a better word. Um, and all this, you know, was to, it made him look sharp, no doubt, but it was showing to the people in an outer way that he had been invested or vested with this responsibility. And, uh, and the high priest, by the way, didn't wear this attire all the time, only when he was uh, performing uh, his official duties in relation to the sanctuary. Uh, this robe, also an interesting thing about it, uh, is it's written in Exodus chapter 28 and 29 that they sewed at the bottom of this robe on the, on the, the um, edging of it, if you will, the hem of it, I'm trying this word I'm trying to grasp there, uh, a bells and pomegranates. First a bell and then a pomegranate and then another bell. So that when at the Day of Atonement, which we'll cover in chapter 16 of Leviticus, when he went into the Holy of Holies, they could hear the little bells tinkling and know that he was still alive and kicking and hadn't expired in the presence of our Heavenly Father in the Holy of Holies. Verse 8. And he put the breastplate upon him, and he put in the breastplate the Urim and the Thummim. Now, this breastplate was worn uh, over the ephod that was uh, discussed in verse 7, and it also, again, made of the same material as the ephod. Um, now the breastplate is also in Exodus called the breastplate of judgment and a lot more detail about uh, the breastplate of judgment in the book of Exodus chapter 28 and 29 uh, in addition to being real sharp looking it also had on it the 12 stones one of each of the stones representing the tribes of Israel and they were set up in, row, in four rows four rows of three stones, one for each of the tribe of Israel, and this was symbolic of the high priest wearing the tribes of Israel on his heart whenever he put the breastplate on. Now the Urim and Thummim, uh, there's a lot of speculation about, uh, and we're not told a lot in the Bible. It seems like that just all of a sudden the Urim and the Thummim were there. Uh, what do they mean in the Hebrew? Well, the Urim in the Hebrew means lights, and thummim means perfections, and these were placed in a pouch, if you will, in the breastplate, and whenever major decisions were to be made in Israel, uh, they consulted of the Lord through the Urim and Thummim, and uh, some say it was by chance, well, uh, if God didn't want it to be by chance and, and was influencing decisions, uh, for example, if Israel were... Uh, trying to decide whether to go to war against another nation. They would consult the high priest or consult God actually through the high priest through the use of the Urim and the Thummim. And uh, when one came out, drawn out, it meant, yes, the Lord says go to war. The other meant, no, you don't go. Verse 9. And he put the miter, this being a turban or a cap, upon his head. Also upon the miter even upon his forefront did he put the golden plate, the holy crown, as the Lord commanded Moses. And again, all symbolic of his being endowed uh, with the character uh, necessary to serve <clears throat> as the high priest, uh, representing the nation of Israel in extreme relations with our Father. Now this golden plate, well, you could think of probably as a uh, diadem that was attached to the front of this turban that the high priest wore. 
verse 10. And Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was therein and sanctified them. This was instructed again in Exodus. Uh, he anointed the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the altar of the incense, the candlestick, uh, the table of showbread, all the furniture of the inner sanctuary. And um, what was this oil for? Well, it was to cover the sins that were attached to it. It's, it's, in other words, the temple is now being sanctified sanctified uh, for the priests to begin their responsibilities now that they're being consecrated. So with the holy oil, the anointing oil, he is more or less sanctifying the contents of the sanctuary as they are about to begin to be utilized. Verse 11, And he sprinkled thereof upon the altar seven times, and anointed the altar and all his vessels, both the laver and his foot, and more on that in a minute, uh, to sanctify them. And again, to sanctify means to set it apart or to make it clean. And of course, the laver is a, a large basin for washing the sacrifices. The foot is, is just the base that this large uh, basin sat upon. And again, I think the reason that he's uh, seven, why seven times? Well, it's spiritual completeness. And, uh, and we are talking, by the way, about the altar of burnt offering here, not the altar of incense, which was taken care of in verse 10. And I think what we're seeing here is that this altar of burnt offering is, is more or less being set up as the way that Israel will uh, atone for their sins through their sin offerings. Verse 12, and he poured of the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him, to sanctify to be clean. As we'll see in a moment, that not only were, are we sanctifying with the oil, but there will be blood utilized to sanctify as well. And uh, some scholars point out that the purpose of the anointing was uh, endowing or filling them with the Spirit of God, for one, but that the oil also covered them in the presence of the Lord. In other words, it covered their sins, whereas the blood actually atoned or expiated the sin. Verse 13, and another thing on the anointing, if you're not familiar with that, well, why should we as Christians be concerned with anointing? Well, Jesus Christ, if you know the Greek meaning of his name, part of his name, Christ, Christos, in the Greek means the anointed one. And this oil, again, it's not something that Moses just made up. These were instructions from Yahweh to him. This is the way that you will consecrate the priests. Verse 13, And Moses brought Aaron's sons and put coats upon them and girded them with girdles and put bonnets upon them, and this being bound headdresses upon them, as the Lord commanded Moses. Now the priest, the normal priest, and by that I mean all the priests other than the high priest, wore these robes uh, and the, the girded with the girdles on a daily basis in their daily activities no matter what they were doing. Now the high priest on the other hand wore again these, the, the, his outfit that was uh, designated by God for him to wear his, the robe and everything only when serving in official capacities. And as we'll see uh, in a later uh, part of this chapter or the next chapter, that the high priest robe was to be passed down from generation to generation. In other words, the son of Aaron who would be chosen to replace Aaron as the high priest, which eventually would be Eleazar, would uh, take the high priest robe and inherit it basically from his father. And, and it wouldn't become worn out over the centuries because it wasn't worn. 
Warren all that much, just at uh, the, the special feasts throughout the year. Verse 14, and he, this being Moses, brought the bullock of the sin offering, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the head of the bullock for the sin offering. And, uh, sin estranges us from the ability to enter into a close relationship with God. Uh, he's holy and he calls upon his people to be holy. And with that sin hanging on to them, the priest no way could enter into that close relationship and communion with our Heavenly Father. So the first thing they have to do is offer this bullock as a sin offering. And when they lay their hands on the head, uh, some would say that that's transferring the sin, but actually you can't transfer sin. Uh, I think when they laid their hands on that, they were transferring the conscience, their consciousness of their own sins and and more or less uh, designating the, the sin offering, in this case the bullock, uh, in their stead to take their place. Verse 15, and he slew it, and Moses took the blood and put it upon the horns of the altar round about with his finger and purified the altar. And this is, by the way, the altar of burnt offering. And poured the blood at the bottom of the altar and sanctified it to make reconciliation upon it. And you'll note that blood was not taken into the sanctuary. Do you remember when we were studying first about the sin offerings in chapter 4? What was it that the, the, the sins of the high priest, when those were atoned for, blood was to be taken into the sanctuary and slung on the veil seven times. Do you recall that? And also for the sins of all the people. But in this case, it's going to be handled differently in that uh, the blood, as you noticed in verse 15 and the following verses, is not going to be taken into the sanctuary. And we'll find out why in either the latter part of this lecture or the next. Verse 16, and he took all the fat that was upon the inwards and the cowl above the liver and the two kidneys and their fat and Moses, bur and Moses burned it upon the altar. And this burn is katar, uh, to vaporize as you, or as you would use to burn incense. This uh, obviously the, the, uh, s uh, the smoke from the fat was uh, ascending to our father and being offered to him. Or what about the rest of the flesh? But the bullock and his hide, his flesh, and his dung, he burnt with fire without the camp. Now this burnt is seraph, to burn down as, as sin is supposed to be down. As the Lord commanded Moses and uh, for a sin offering of the uh, laity or for all the congregation, you'll remember that uh, the animal was done away with too. But if it were for an individual of the laity, then the priests were required to eat the sin offering, the flesh. Verse 18, and he, this being Moses, brought the ram for the burnt offering, and Aaron and his sons lay their hands upon the head of the ram. And the burnt offering uh, thought of as a total surrender to God. Now that the sin has been taken care of through the sin offering, and they're able to enter into a closer relationship with our Father. Verse 19, and he killed it, and Moses sprinkled the blood upon upon the altar round about. Verse 20, and he cut the ram into pieces and Moses burnt the head and the pieces of the fat. This is a burnt offering also known as a whole offering. In other words, the whole animal, uh, except for the unclean parts, were offered on the altar of burnt offering, 21. And he washed the inwards and the legs in water. This would be what that basin or the laver that we were talking about back in verse 11 would be utilized for. Uh, and washed the legs in water, and Moses burnt the whole ram upon the altar. It was a burnt sacrifice for a sweet savor, <clears throat> and an offering made by fire unto the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses, a savor of satisfaction to the Father. 
22, and he brought the other ram, the ram of consecration, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the head of the ram. And what we have here is a type of peace offering, and here it's called the uh, consecration, which that actually in the Hebrew is a fill offering, or the, the, you could translate even the filling of the hand, and that's what they're doing is filling the hand of the priest uh, with this particular offering, but there are uh, notable differences between this peace offering and the other peace offerings that we studied about in chapter 3, as we'll see in a moment. 23. And he slew it, and Moses took of the blood of it, and put it upon the tip of Aaron's right ear, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot. And this being very symbolic, uh, the uh, touching of the peace offering blood on his right ear, uh, symbolic that he is to hearken to the commandments of God, uh, the, on the thumb that he was to work uh, to f properly fulfill the responsibilities of his office in relation to the commandments of God, and that on the right toe of the right foot was to symbolically uh, start that he was to walk correctly in his duties in relation to the sanctuary. Verse 24, And he brought Aaron's sons, and Moses put of the blood upon the tip of their right ear, and upon the thumbs of their right hands, and upon the great toes of their right feet. And Moses sprinkled the blood upon the altar round about. And all of this lined out exactly as God described it. Now, would all of the priests walk as they're supposed to and work as they're supposed to and hear the commandment of the Lord? Well, hang on until we get to the first few verses of chapter 10, and we'll see what happened to the oldest two sons of Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu. They had a problem following directions, 25. And he took the fat and the rump, this being the fat tail of the sheep, and remember when we first studied that, some of them weighing up to 15 pounds, and all the fat that was upon the inwards and the cow above the liver and the two kidneys and their fat and the right shoulder. Normally this right shoulder along with the breast would be long, the wave breast would belong to the priest you might examine, uh, might remember, but won't be the case this time, 26. And out of the basket of unleavened bread that was before the Lord, he took one unleavened cake and a cake of oil bread and one wafer, in other words, one of each type as instructed by God, and put them on the fat and upon the right shoulder. Verse 27, and he put all upon Aaron's hands and upon his son's hands and waved them for a wave offering before the Lord. And this, again, a back and forth motion horizontally toward the altar of burnt offering, symbolically toward the Lord. And then as it came back, it was uh, God's at that point from the offerer, but it was God's to give to whomever he chose. 28, and Moses took them from off their hands and burnt them on the altar upon the burnt offering. And they were consecrations for a sweet savor. It is an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And actually we see Moses performing uh, the duties and responsibilities of the priest, uh, is he not? So he is entitled to that uh, uh, pie and wave breast as we'll see in a moment. But from this point on after this consecration process, which they'll go through this for seven straight days, each day, all of these will be repeated. The washing with the water, the uh, sin offering, the uh, burnt offering, then the peace offering of consecration. And uh, every day, for seven days, they'll go through this same procedure. Each day, no doubt, intensifying uh, the, the consecration, the solemnness of it. It's an important office that these folks are entering into. God takes it very seriously, 29. 
And Moses took the breast, this is the wave breast, and waved it for a wave offering before the Lord. For the ram of consecration, it was Moses' part, as the Lord commanded Moses. And this wave offering, again, in the Hebrew is tenufa, and it's uh, just to, to take it to and fro toward the Lord and then back. Verse 30, And Moses took the anointing oil, and of the blood which was upon the altar, you know, blood uh, being symbolic of the soul, oil being symbolic of the Holy Spirit, remember, and sprinkled it upon Aaron and upon his garments and upon his sons and upon his son's garments with him and sanctified Aaron, that means to make clean or set apart, and his garments and his sons and his son's garments with him. And again, here I think this is symbolic of endowing uh, both the soul through the blood and the spirit through the oil. So uh, back when they were washed with water, we had their flesh cleansed, the blood uh, taking care of their soul, the oil uh, endowing them with the spirit of God. So we have uh, body, uh, soul, and spirit spirit involved here being dedicated to the service of the sanctuary. 31. And Moses said unto Aaron and to his sons, Boil the flesh at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and there eat it with the bread that is in the basket of consecration. Crescens, I should say, as I commanded, saying, Aaron and his sons shall eat it. So here we have the sacrificial meal being partaken of, and in this case it will be only for the priests themselves. 32. And that which remaineth of the flesh and of the bread shall ye burn with fire. And as we learn back in chapter 7, verses 17 and 18, that it was not to be partaken of on the third day. And it depended on what type of peace offering it was. Uh, if it was a thanks offering, a thanksgiving offering, you remember it had to be partaken of the, within one day. If it was a vow or a free will offering, uh, then and it could be partaken of the second day. But then after that, it was, if there were any left, if it were eaten, it was an abomination and not accepted of the Lord and to be burned with the, uh, at the place of the sin offerings without the camp. Verse 33, And ye shall not go out of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation in seven days, until the days of your consecration be at an end. For seven days shall he consecrate you. And again, this word consecrate is to separate apart, or setting them apart for service in the sanctuary. And I don't think the seven days is to be taken literally. I mean, even so far as uh, taking care of the necessities of nature, I think this simply meant that they were not to to go about normal business other than tending to their responsibilities at the sanctuary for these seven days. <clears throat> And again, each of these seven days, this was to be repeated. Uh, and again, we see in the number seven, uh, spiritually, the significance of that number is the completeness of God's works. And, and each day of this, I think, intensifying the uh, how solemn of an affair this was in, in the people's eyes, in God's eyes, and the priest's eyes, 34. As he hath done this day, so the Lord hath commanded to do, to make an atonement for you, an atonement to uh, cover their, their sins, if you will. 35. Therefore shall ye abide at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation day and night seven days, and keep the charge of the Lord, <clears throat> that ye die not, for so I am commanded, and repeated uh, the sacrifices and anointed each day the same procedure and that 
the you die not, there's a pretty solemn warning within that, is there not? And uh, he, unfortunately, is, God is going to have to show that he means exactly that uh, when his instructions are not carried out, as we'll see in chapter 10, <clears throat> verse 36, to complete this chapter. So Aaron and his sons did all things which the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. And again, not <clears throat> Moses' commandment, but <clears throat> God's commandment through Moses. I meant to point that out too back in verse 31 uh, where it states as I commanded Moses saying that and I think that a lot of folks have that translated. It should have been translated as I have been commanded Moses speaking and this, these were, again, my point was that these aren't the instructions of Moses. These are the instructions of our Heavenly Father being carried out. So for seven days, all of these sacrifices and anointings are repeated. And then on day eight, the actual uh, day that the priest, uh, the high priest, Aaron and his sons will enter into office and start performing their duties. Chapter nine. And it came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. Uh, the number eight in biblical numerics is new beginnings. And uh, we have definitely a new beginning here now that Israel has a high priest too. And he said unto Aaron, Take thee a young calf. Notice a young calf, not a bullock as the previous seven days, or in the case of a sin offering by the priest uh, when it comes to his attention in the normal procedure as, as, as we studied in chapter 4. Uh, more on why it's a young calf in a moment. For a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering without blemish and offer them before the Lord. Again, we see that type in the sacrifices of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. These sacrifices weren't to be uh, the scrubs, as we called them when I was a kid on the farm, uh, the worst of your livestock. In other words, these were to be without blemish and because they're being uh, sacrificed to our Heavenly Father. You give our Heavenly Father the best you have to give. Now, why? Okay, let's let's talk about this a minute. We've got seven days that the high priest has offered a sin offering for himself, and and he still has sin attached to him. You bet he does, and and we all do. And it's not just the sin; it's, it's not a specific sin. I think that. Aaron had committed, and that's the reason I think that the blood was not taken into the sanctuary as it was instructed in chapter 4, that for his particular sin, the high priest's particular sin, that the blood was to be taken into the sanctuary and also for the sins of all the people. But and I think what we have here is the, the um, it's trying to pound into the priest's head that uh, flesh is sin and everything we do in the flesh has sin attached to it and but we're seeing this consecration procedure and we notice that on the eighth day it's not required that he bring a bullock, but a young calf, a less expensive animal. So possibly the, the, um, the Lord seeing it that he doesn't have as much sin attached to him still. So and as it's written in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, that the blood of animals cannot uh, do away with sin. They don't take away sin. And there's only one way that we can take away sin, and that's through belief on Jesus Christ and repentance and asking our Father for forgiveness. And again, I'll state I'm glad that we are in this dispensation, living in this dispensation, instead of the dispensation that uh, this was written in, which although all these people, you have to realize what was the first thing that Christ did when he was in the tomb. He went to all those that were in prison, all of those that were living in this time, and he preached to them, as it's written in Second Peter chapter 3, First uh, Peter chapter 3, excuse me, and many of them believed and were saved at that time. So they got the same opportunity. You have to always remember our Father is fair.
Well, we'll come back and finish the consecration of the priest in our next lecture and also learn, you know, with all these laws being set now, the law of sacrifices and the priest being consecrated, the law will have been given. Will man be able to live according to it? In chapter 10, we'll find out they didn't do a very good job coming out the gate. We've got a short message. Won't you? Our Father truly loves you. I love you because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in more depth. But what's really important, He loves you for that. It really makes His day. And I want you to know that I appreciate you. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. Know what? He will always bless you. But there's one thing that's more important than anything else. That's this, that you stay in his word every day. In his word is a good day, even with problems. You know why? Jesus is the living word. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.